I certainly f f feel um, I feel that I'm very I'm very glad that I have a strong sense of my identity and community and sometimes talking to younger people who merely see it as a sexual preference don't have that sense of fight for our yeah. community and that sense of commitment um, to the community and in a discussion the other day actually a younger woman when we were talking about the dynamics in relationships a young woman lesbian woman sitting there with her partner said well actually I think most lesbian relationships are unhealthy and I mean, I think my jaw probably fell to the floor. I was really shocked that she said that. It was her, it was how she perceived things and her experience. Um, but I found that quite disturbing. And I felt she wasn't aware, for example, saying something like, most lesbian relationships are unhealthy is what straight people would have said, what medical people said very, very short time ago. Um, and it's almost like saying, well, lesbian relationships aren't normal. What does unhealthy mm. mean? Mm. And I suppose I, it made me feel aware that she had no sense of the politics of being lesbian to sort of protect her from that anti-lesbian feeling. Mm. Do you see what I mean? Uh, yeah, and I think it's it's how we have always stepped up to challenges to make ourselves visible. Mm. And like, for example, the Green and Common, like doing things that make us visible has been important. Yeah. And just like you know, a couple of years ago, you know, having these groups and running the groups and putting our time and energy yeah. so that people can do that. Yeah. And a couple of years ago, um, as I said, you know, I, I do some ballroom and Latin dancing and there's a national competition at Blackpool every year. And it is very much like the Strictly Come dancing with the glitter and the gamma and all the girls. And it was the first time our dance school took a group of lesbian and gay people to a very, very straight dance competition. And I don't do competitions. And the way they got me to go there is by saying, well, this will be a first. And it's about making a statement mm. that there are lesbian and gay people on the dance scene, mm. that we're not invisible that mm. we're, and to be seen. Mm. And, um, and we went there, and a small group of us went there, and we competed and we danced and we did extremely well. But you could see the rest of the um, competitors, there were something like two and a half thousand people, um, sort of competitors and, and audience, seeing all these same sex people on the dance floor and where they could just about manage seeing women dancing, they really had a difficult time seeing the men dancing. Mm. on the floor. They mm. found that really, really difficult. Mm. But, um, you know, we made that statement and this year to, it, to Blackpool there are three same-sex dance schools going to wow. compete at Blackpool. Mm. And I think that those things are what are important because yeah. it allows people to be, and, 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 and people would come up to us and say, like one guy came up to us and said, I, we're, I'm really pleased, I'm delighted that you're on the dance floor. I'm a dance teacher but I don't teach in London and therefore I can't be out, I can't, I can't come out as a gay person because I work with children and the perceptions of that and um, I'm really glad that you have been brave and to come down and, and many people uh, spoke to us um, on, that, on that day about doing yeah. that but it's, it's fantastic now that there are three um, same-sex dance schools mm. going to complete this year. Mm. Another thing about visibility just reminded me um, there used to be the Saturday, either before or after Gay Pride, for a few years there were, was a march called Lesbian Strength, yeah, which I was the women that. only uh, march. And I think the greatest number we ever had was a thousand. We were really, really pleased when there was a thousand. I think 
it had started off like two or three hundred. And when we did that, when we marched, we had wall-to-wall -wall police officers either side of us on this march. And now when I, you know, go to Gay Pride in Brighton or London, you're, you're hard-pressed to see police, actually, aren't you? Um, and in those days, you had to have wall-to-wall -wall police because it was for your protection. Um, mm. And now, Gay Pride, mm. there, are, there are maybe a few poli police around, but they're few and far between, and they're certainly not walking along with you along the march. Well, I remember when I to. was training as a nurse, and as I said, you know, I had some of my first relationships when I was nursing. Seducing Irish nurses. <laughs> <laughs> Converting them. Yeah. Yeah, not, yeah. yeah. <laughs> a different sort of conversion. Um, but where one, one of those, uh, one of them had spoken to our tutor when, well, well it's two things that happened. What, I was having a relationship with this woman that ended and she went to talk to the tutor and the tutor summoned me to, and I was still a student at that time, and he summoned me to uh, his office and said that he, he knew about this relationship and that um, he didn't know what to do about it and maybe I should think about leaving nursing. And I said, why? I said, well, you know, how are we going to cope with you, with all the other nurses in the nurses' home? And I said, Fine, you know, and he said, "Well, I have to make sure that you don't work on the on the women's wards." And I said, "But why? You have male nurses working on the women's wards, and shouldn't and you have women working on men's wards?" Yeah. And it was like he couldn't get his head around, and and it came to a point that I was almost asked to leave mm. nursing mm. because they just didn't know how and to and, handle it. And I mean, look at look at. What that, what that meant for you. You yeah. were being fa faced with possibly losing your career yes. and your job yeah. because of your sexuality. sexuality. Yeah, indeed. Yeah. Just like the time when you almost lost your job yeah. through my work. Yeah. Um, yeah. In the 80s, mm. when I was an HIV coordinator and they found out that well, I was involved. Yeah, it was before that. It was actually when you were a nurse, uh, looking after terminally ill people with HIV, with HIV. Yeah. and um, I had said to my staff, uh, a member of staff, that I was going to visit this guy in the hospital and I said it, that's what I was going to do and anyway she had told various other people and the story kind of got bigger and bigger until it was Angie is living with an HIV doctor um, and this was in the days of kind of in the sun, it was the gay plague, it was, uh, you know, there was an absolute panic about um, HIV and they were saying, I worked in a nursery and they were saying, well, you know, if Angie's changing a baby and she happens to be crying and a tear falls from her face onto the baby, she'll infect the baby. That's assuming, of course, that I'm HIV positive. She's HIV positive because she's an HIV doctor. I mean, it was total madness, but it was an incredibly frightening time. And there were parents who were saying, if she, either Angie leaves or we leave, and we'll put placards in the street saying this is an AIDS nursery. Because they weren't saying HIV, they were saying AIDS, AIDS actually. But they also they, they said didn't that have that language, HIV, it was AIDS. They said that you either had to leave me or leave the leave, job. Oh, leave Teresa or leave the job, and that kind of thing. And that was a really yeah. terrifying time. And that's the early 80s. I yes. mean, this is not the 1900s. Do no. you know what I mean? It's, like, it's amazing to think about that now, yeah. really. And that, yeah. was, that was a very difficult... Time Very difficult time. Come, when through. when I was I went to a, a a convent school, Catholic convent school, and I had a very strong friendship with a girl from when I was eleven to when I was fifteen, and I we we loved each other. We were inseparable, and I had 
gone to the Isle of Wight Pop Festival with her when I was 15, came back and one of our essays was kind of what did you do in the summer holidays and it was well I went to the Isle of Wight Festival and we saw Jimi Hendrix and the Who and I love Fiona and I'm in love with her and all this stuff and I was, um, both of us, Fiona and I, were taken in front of the headmistress who was a nun and we were told that if we carried on like this we wouldn't make good wives and mothers, we weren't allowed to sit next to each other in class, we were taken out of houses, you had you were in houses to play sport and um, she was put into a different house so that our, t our houses would be playing netball against each other so we'd be our you know, competing and uh, in sports against each other. And we weren't allowed to sit next to each other in class. And I remember our class being appalled at the treatment that we'd had. And we would write notes to each other in class and all the girls would pass the notes along um, to um, so that we could uh, still so communicate talk with each other in class. Yeah. I mean, it was a bit like... The thing with in the, when I was this, in nursing, you know, when I was asked almost to leave, mm. and that was partly because the person I was with was a strict had been brought up a strict Catholic in Ireland and and didn't know how to deal with having a relationship with a woman mm. and her religion and her mm. Catholicism, mm. Mm. and and that's the reason why we split up because she couldn't she couldn't manage what she had been brought up mm. as in mm. in rural. Ireland mm. and then she'd come to London and then she'd had this relationship with this woman and she really just didn't know how to deal mm. with it. So mm. I've never really felt angry towards her about the situation but certainly um, religion and, and culture and things like that play a huge part in how we come out and how we deal yeah. with and, and how it impacts. Yeah. Because uh, you know mm. 